Hey, good morning. Welcome to Westbridge Church. My name is Jeremiah. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's awesome to have you with us. Hello to those of you in our online campus, our parent viewing rooms. Uh, That's a great option if you have small children you prefer to keep with you during the service. And then we've also got seating in our cafe area where you can view the service as well. And uh, before we jump into part two of our series, Help, I'm a Parent, uh, a couple of quick housekeeping items. Uh, First of all, if you have kids that you checked in the kids area, you should get a little tag like this. And when you go to check them out, you are going to need this uh, because we have some very friendly bouncers who will check this. And we are being total sticklers about this, and here's why. Uh, We just want to make sure as we continue to grow as a church and as more and more kids and families show up, that uh, not only is it a fun place and place where kids are having a blast and learning about uh, the love of Jesus, but also that it's a safe place. So this helps us with security to make sure that we don't have anybody wandering around through our kids area that uh, really doesn't need to be back there. And so if you've got that tag, uh, they're going to be checking that. Please have that ready. Uh, And if for some reason you misplace it, uh, you can always print a new one, but we'd rather you go and print a new one than, uh, you know, be lax on security. So thanks for your help with that. Uh, And then the other quick thing is, if we've never met before, I would love for you to come say hi. I'm going to be hanging out in the lobby. Uh, I'm always around and just love connecting with people. If you've been coming for a period of time, you're somewhat new to Westbridge and we've never met, you've been coming recently, I'd love to connect with you. And uh, we have something next Sunday afternoon called a welcome party, and we would love for you to come to that. Uh, It's just coffee, no agenda, uh, just hanging out and getting to connect with you and answer any questions. We've got childcare for that, and you can register for all of that. Uh, on the Church Center app. Uh, lastly, I just want to mention this. As, as these services fill up, like 9.30 and 11 are getting you know, more and more full, and if you're like, man, I really need a little bit more elbow room, uh, there's plenty of seats at 8 a.m. So I just wanted to throw that out there. I just want to let you know. So uh, we're in the second week of a series called Help, I'm a Parent. And last week, we kicked off this series, and some of the most consistent feedback that I received last week was this. Uh, I heard this from many people. I wish I would have heard that 20 years ago. I wish I would have heard that 10 years ago. I wish I would have heard that when my kids were younger. And so I wanted to kick off today and just let you know that uh, what we're going to talk about today are things that you can actually put into practice, even if you have adult children, and even if you feel like, man, it, I, you know, I've got some regrets. There's some things I wish I would have done differently. Can I, just, can I just ease that for you a little bit? Welcome to the club, okay? Uh, all of us as parents have things that we wish we would have done differently. We have regrets. We look back and we go, man, I totally handled that poorly. Uh, that was a season where I wasn't as present as I should have been. Here was something that, I, man, I, I, I wish that we would have done this more effectively. We all have that stuff, okay? But here's what I know. God is more concerned with your future than he is with your past. And I, I, I genuinely believe, I would not do what I do if I didn't believe this that if we can take some of the things that we're going to talk about today and put them into practice, own our part of it, and then put some of these things into practice, that even if you have a strained relationship with some adult kids, I genuinely believe that God can restore relationship, that God can redeem those things. And while we live in what is real, we also strive for the ideal. And we, we do our best to say, okay, God, I got to own my part in this, but I'm going to work towards reconciliation and restoration, and, and there's hope in that. And I would not do what I do if I didn't believe that. And so I want you to know God can redeem that if you're willing to work on it. And so uh, I want to give you hope today. Even if you're like that parent who's like, man, you know what? I just, I, I, I messed up. Uh, you can still own it. You can still move forward, and God can redeem that. So as we jump into week two, uh, I want to share with you some of my favorite tweets from the last week because on Twitter, I follow a couple of people. One is called Sarcastic Mommy, and she puts some great stuff out. Uh, Let's look at a couple of her tweets here today. Uh, Sarcastic Mommy tweeted this last week. I love Sunday nights because that's the night my kids tell me they don't have any homework and then end up asking if I can go buy printer ink at 10 p.m. Regular routine at her house. Uh, This is one she actually retweeted from uh, Snarky Mommy, who I don't follow yet. Parenting, where one minute you're breaking up fights and sending everyone to their rooms, and the next you're crying over their baby pictures on your phone. Parenting is the highest of highs and the lowest of lows, right? Uh, How about this one? Sarcastic Mommy says this, if you're on the fence about having kids, repeat, put your shoes on, please, 100 times in a row until you're in a blinding rage and see if it's a fit for you. I love that. And then there's a guy named Sammy Rhodes who I follow. He's a college pastor in South Carolina. And he puts this picture up and says, me on an important Zoom call trying to ignore my kids fighting. That's very, you know, appropriate. And then I love this. He puts this one up. Me becoming a father for the first time versus me trying to raise teenagers. And uh, you can see it's aged him a little bit, right? 
<laughs> like, wow, quite the difference there. And so with all that in mind, I want to remind us of this verse that we shared last week from the Psalms, where King David writes about this, and we genuinely believe this, that children are a gift from God. We said this last week, there are no accidental kids. There are accidental parents, there are no accidental kids. And here's what uh, King David writes in the Psalms. He says, children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hands. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. And really, this is written in a society where if you translated it today, it's joyful is the parent whose quiver is full. It's not just limited to men. And there are three things that you do with an arrow. You aim it, you pull it back, and then you release it, right? And you do the same thing with kids. When you think about it, you aim it. You give your kids direction. And you, you pull it back, you prepare them, and then, this is my favorite part, you release it and you send them flying. And uh, today, I want to discuss four things that every kid needs from parents and adults in their life. And here's the secret, because again, you can put these things into practice with your adult children. And here's what's amazing, we all need these things. I need these things. We all need these things from our parents. And so uh, remember, it's never too late to begin to put some of these things into practice and to begin to make a difference even with adult children. So, uh, but for those of us who are in the thick of parenting, like we are, I, I want to remind you, uh, we have eight years, uh, 14, 16, and 19. And uh, so this is not a series about, hey, let me tell you how we nailed it, all right? This is, we're trying to limit the amount of therapy our kids have someday, so we're in the, navigating this with you, okay? So that's what this is. All right, number one, here's what kids need. Unconditional acceptance. Unconditional acceptance. All of us need language that expresses to our kids, I love you, nothing will ever change that. I love you, nothing will ever change that. Somehow, some way, you need language that expresses to your kids, you love them no matter what, you care about them, you accept them no matter what. Some of you will remember the name Greg Louganis. Many of you, maybe you won't, but uh, Greg Louganis was a Olympic diver uh, back in the 80s, and uh, he represented the United States in the Olympics, and many consider him to be one of the uh, best divers of all time. And in the 1988 Summer Olympics in Seoul, Korea, he encountered some challenges. In one of his dives, he hit his head in the same spot that had killed a diver five years earlier. And so he comes back, he's doing a backflip, and his head comes back and smacks the, the, the diving board. And he actually had to get stitches in his head. He's bleeding into the pool. And in his attempt for gold, he decided to uh, go uh, and do a reverse uh, three and a half somersault tuck. And so he got stitched up. He went back in. He goes for this incredible dive. And it's this breathtaking finish. It brought everybody to their feet. And I, I, I actually remember this uh, as uh, I was eight years old. I'm watching the Olympics. I'm watching this. And uh, it was unbelievable. I remember this as a kid, 1988. And when reporters hounded him, he gets back to Los Angeles after the Olympics. And reporters come up to him. And they're like, man, like, what were you thinking? There's all this pressure on you to perform this dive. And in the back of your mind, you know that it's the same spot that a diver had died five years earlier. Man, what's going through your mind? And this was Greg's response. He said, all I knew was that no matter what happened, my mom would still love me. And the reason for that was because when, he, when Greg was 11 years old, he was very frustrated at a diving competition, and he had been uh, having a bad performance, and, and he just was so frustrated with himself, and it was an important meet. And his mom, her name was Frances, she pulled him aside, and she goes, Greg, I don't come here to watch you win. I come here to watch you dive. So you do your best, and I want you to know that no matter what happens, I will always love you. And it was that that gave him such confidence that he actually won 43 national diving titles and four Olympic gold medals. And that's all he could remember. I knew that no matter what happened, my mom would still love me. Now, I tell you that story because the challenge for most of us as parents is not that we don't believe the exact same thing. I have yet to meet the parent that says, nope, if my kid does this, I'm done with them. As parents, we go, yeah, of course. There's nothing you could do that would make me not love you. The challenge for us as parents is not that we don't believe it. It's that often we don't express it. Often we don't share that with our kids. And we need to, we need to share it with them on a consistent basis so that that seed gets planted so deep in their hearts. And often in the heat of parenting, what we need to do is just pull our kids close and remind them, hey, there is nothing that you could ever do that would change how I feel about you. 
I love you. I accept you no matter what. When my oldest daughter was about two years old, uh, we had this pattern that we would repeat, and uh, usually around bedtime, but sometimes during the day, and uh, one of us would say, I love you, and then the next person would say, I love you more, and then the next person would say, I love you the mostest, and that was like the ultimate, the mostest, like you can't go past mostest, right? Everybody knows that. And so uh, when she was two, she couldn't pronounce it correctly, so she'd say, I love you, and I'd say, I love you the most, and then she'd go, I love you the moliest. And then that just became a thing for our family where I love you the moliest is code in our house for like, that's the top. You can't love anybody more than I love you the moliest. That's the deepest love that you can have. And, uh, and so I, I wonder, what are you doing to communicate to your kids on a regular basis? I love you the moliest. Like there's nothing that you could do that could ever change how I feel about you. And sometimes... In the heat of parenting, we forget to communicate that our kids' behavior does not equate to how we think about them. Because we're dealing with behavior a lot as parents. And we've got to remember to communicate that my love for you is not rooted in your behavior. We've got to go out of our way to communicate. It's not based on what they've done, but it's based on who you belong to. In fact, this is what Jesus did for us. When the Apostle Paul is starting churches in the first century and he writes a letter back to a church in Ephesus, and, or, or, or sorry, he's writing in, in the Roman Empire, he, he writes this uh, to people who are followers of Jesus in Rome. He says, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. In other words, see, God accepts us into his family and never changes how he thinks about us, even though a lot of times our behavior doesn't line up with God's ways. But he didn't wait for us to get our act together. He says, no, Jesus came into our world. He laid down his life for us. He stuck his neck out for us while we were still sinners. He accepts us without condition. And we must communicate that to our children as well. Unconditional acceptance is something every kid needs. Here's the second thing every kid needs. Ongoing physical affection. Ongoing physical affection. And I added the modifier ongoing for the guys in here because I know guys, we're simple creatures. And if I just said affection, you might go home and hug your kid and be like, done, man, check it off the list. Mic drop, boom. See you when you're 18. And we're simple creatures. Guys have the, you know, for some guys, I know I'm being a little stereotypical here, but some of us have the emotional equivalence of a brick. And so ladies, you tend to be better at like showing affection on an ongoing basis. That's why no kid has ever gotten hurt in the front yard and run into the house going, Dad. What do they yell? Mom. Yeah, because mom cares. And uh, I just remember, like, as a kid, I could have, like, a broken arm. And, you know, my dad would be like, rub some dirt in it. You'll be fine. Right? Shake it off. Shake it off. Just walk it off. Like, I'd love to, but my bone is sticking out of my skin. But as a kid, I remember, like, every kid has this experience where you're, like, get sick in the middle of the night and you're going to throw up. And so you kind of wake up and you're like, oh no. And you're like riding the snake, you know. And then, and then you go and you're like throwing up and what happens? Like your mom hears that. And she's like, and, and as you're throwing up, she's there rubbing your back, right? Cold washcloth on your forehead, you know, analyzing what you had for dinner. And, uh, and I remember like thinking to myself as a kid, where's dad? And then I became a dad, and I know exactly where he was. He was sleeping. He was tired. This idea of affection is something that emotionally healthy kids have in common. See, they've been given proper affection, and they've received a lot of it. And social scientists refer to this as skin hunger. There's actually a term for this. We desire affection, and it must be fed in appropriate ways, because if it isn't, then we settle for inappropriate affection, and we become emotionally distant from other people. And when, when we're not given affection, healthy amounts of affection in appropriate ways, then what we do is we search for physical affection in unhealthy, inappropriate ways. And guess what? Our culture has a lot of opportunities to feed that. And then we get scarred as a result, and then we become emotionally distant from the people that we're closest to because we push them away because of our scars that we've built up. And that isn't what God created you for. It's not what God designed you for. And so it, we've got to show proper physical affection. And if we don't, our kids suffer as a result. Dads, this is so critical. 
And I'm picking on dads just for a second because of statistics that show that unaffectionate dads, when they, when they can't show affection to their kids, produce young men who don't know how to express themselves emotionally. And when dads are unable to show physical affection to their daughters, daughters, they raise young women who, statistically speaking, again, this is a bit of a stereotype, but based on the statistics, then uh, try to pursue physical affection from other men and end up leaning towards uh, sexual promiscuity just because uh, they have this hunger for affection and they find it somewhere else. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, when I talk about affection, some of you have warning lights and I understand that. Some of you grew up in a setting where this was not modeled. Some of you grew up in a setting where, uh, you know, this wasn't your parents' personality or maybe for some reason they, they had, you know, the affection bypass surgery and never passed it on to you. For some of you, uh, you go, this is not my personality. But at some point, you have to break that cycle so that you don't pass on to your kids the wounds that you experienced as a kid. And for some of you, you experienced unhealthy, inappropriate affection. And if that's you, I am so sorry. You didn't deserve that. It is not your fault. And you have a difficult time showing affection because of the scars that that created for you. And I want you to know that God loves you and God sees you. And I can't even imagine the hurdle that that is for you. But I want to encourage you to talk to someone, to find a way to work through that hurdle if it comes to this area of affection in your life with kids in your life, because you don't want your hurdle to become a wound in the life of your kids. Kids need Affection. We determined, my wife and I determined early on, we were going to be affection on steroids. We're going to just hug the crap out of these kids <laughs> every chance we get. And so that affection is deeper than words. It shows love in today's culture uh, where affection can become neglected or twisted. And today, uh, we can be in a relationship with someone and we don't even have to be face to face with them. We can be in a relationship with someone and we don't have, to have any physical contact. And that skin hunger is very, very real. And so John, one of Jesus' closest friends and followers, as he is writing later on and, and giving instructions to people about how to follow the way of Jesus, he writes this in one of his letters. He says, dear children, let us stop just saying we love each other. Let us really show it by our actions. This applies when it comes to parenting. And those of you who are parents of preteens or teenagers, this is especially important for you to continue to show affection because when puberty hits, that's when most parents kind of back off of showing affection to their kids because their kids feel like they're demon-possessed during that season. And kids are always like, oh, you know, gosh, mom, dad, you're so weird and embarrassing, which is kind of ironic because kids are so awkward during that stage. But man, that's the time when the kids need your affection the most. When they're 12, 13, 14, 15, and it's like they're, they're not kids anymore, but they're not adults yet. Like my 14-year-old needs more affection now than ever before because he's like this, you know, he's going to be taller than me. He's like this gangly 14-year-old who's like trying to figure out how his body works and he's growing a mustache and he's pretty proud of it. And I can see it with a magnifying glass. And this is the time where he needs more affection than ever before. If you need an example of this, just look at fifth through seventh grade boys. What are they doing constantly? They are punching and kicking and wrestling. They're constantly, like, because they're awkward. And parents are, like, backing off of them. But they don't have the emotional intelligence to be like, I have skin hunger. Hold me. They're not going to say that. That's why one of the greatest things you can do with a kid that age is just like put them in a headlock and drag them through the house. They will eat that up. They love it. Now, I'll tell you, I've done a lot of things wrong as a parent, okay? I'm just being honest with you. Like, we have made a lot of mistakes. There's a lot of things that I wish I could go back and undo. We've messed up a bunch, but there isn't a day that goes by that my kids don't get loads of hugs from me and their mom. So every day when I leave, I'm going to work a few miles away. I'm going to see you in a few hours. I hunt down every kid and give them a hug. And then when I get home from work, I hunt down every kid and give them a hug. And then before we go to bed, I hunt down every kid and give them a hug. Like these kids are getting hugs. They're getting one hug, two hugs, three hugs a day. It's going to happen whether you like it or not. And sometimes it's just like, oh, dad, oh. I'm like, bring it in. 
Because affection on steroids, man, we just decided early on they were going to receive loads of affection from us. And let me tell you something, parents. If you push those opportunities away, you push kids away. You push children away. And kids who don't get appropriate affection will seek it out in other areas. And our culture gives them lots of opportunities. I love it. In uh, Paul's letter to the Romans, he writes this. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. I I can't think of another relationship where this applies than with the people that you love the most, people who you're closest to. And there's something that uh, you can put into practice even this afternoon. Why wait? Even if you have adult kids, this is something simple that you can begin to put into practice. Make it a goal. Give your kids a hug every single day, every chance you get, every time that you see them. Now, here's the third thing that uh, every kid needs. Every kid needs serious fun. Serious fun. You're like, fun? How did that make the list? Let me tell you something. Kids need this from parents, and they need it from adults who have influence in their life. Well, why fun? Because this is a stressed out generation. This, the kids that are living today live in a very fast-paced uh, society, and many parents are driven, and they want their kids to be driven. They want their kids to perform. And for some parents who battle insecurity, the better the kids are doing in certain things, the, more, uh, you know, they, the better they feel about themselves as parents. So they jack up all the pressure on their kids, so they feel good about themselves. And yet, kids have to laugh. Kids have to have fun. Kids have to play together. Laughter helps release anxiety. Laughter helps diminish fears. Laughter actually helps lessen hostility and rage and anger. And we are reminded over and over again throughout the scriptures that joy is a good thing, both physically and emotionally. That when we experience joy inside, that it actually affects our bodies, it actually affects our health. The healthiest people you know are joyful people. In fact, uh, King Solomon was one of the ancient kings of Israel who wrote Proverbs. These are sayings of wisdom that he passed on to the next generation. And we get the uh, privilege of reading some of these and experiencing them today. He writes this, a cheerful heart is, a, is good medicine. Now, we have a modern version of that where we say laughter is the best medicine. But that comes straight from Proverbs. A cheerful heart is good medicine. And then he contrasts that. He says, but a broken spirit saps a person's strength. And we've probably all had seasons or moments where we've experienced both of those things, where we've experienced a cheerful heart, and it lightens things. And even when we are facing challenges uh, at our job or facing challenges at school or facing challenges with relationships or friendships, a a cheerful heart is good medicine. It lightens us. It lightens the burden. But a broken spirit also saps our strength. You've, You've experienced that where it makes you weary. It makes you tired. It makes you focus inward. Another thing that he says is this, and in this next verse, he says, a glad heart makes a happy face. A glad heart makes a happy face. There's something that when we experience joy on the inside that actually affects us physically. And I believe that those of us who have aligned ourselves with the person of Jesus ought to be the ones modeling fun. But for some reason, I don't know where this comes from, but some Christians believe that you have to be serious because when you're serious... That is when you are spiritual. That is when you are mature, is when you are serious. And I personally believe that that can be very boring. (laughs) And I've met a lot of boring Christians who look like they've been baptized in lemon juice. And I think it's fascinating. Uh, Like Ecclesiastes, this is Solomon writing. He says, there's a time for everything, including a time to laugh and a time to dance. And I I think that's one of the necessary rhythms of life is dance and laughter. I was talking about this with uh, someone just the other day. It's amazing when you think about this. When music comes on, every toddler dances. It's just in them, right? And they all have the same dance. It's one move. (laughs) That's it. Every toddler has that move. They got it down. And a beat comes on and there's just something in toddlers that they just got to move, you know? And this is a part of, it's it's built into us. Solomon says there's a time for dancing. There's a time for laughing. Those things are healthy. Personally, I think it's great that those go together. Every time I dance, there's laughter. It's amazing. And I want you to know, as a church, we value fun. In fact, this last summer, uh, we went through our values as a staff. 
And we have five values that we've had since the very beginning, 16 years ago. We said, these are the five things we're going to value. These are our core values. We teach on them every summer. And this year, for the first time in 16 years, we added a core value to our five values. We now have six. And the sixth one is this. We have fun. Now, that's always been a part of who we are. So we decided, let's name it. And here's what we said. We are going to take our faith seriously. We're going to take Jesus seriously. But we are not going to take ourselves seriously. That's important. Some of you grew up in church where you never laughed, where smiling was discouraged, where a grimace was preferred. And for some of you, that shaped not only your view of church, but it shaped your view of God. And that is the version of God that you've been sort of running from. God is this cosmic killjoy waiting to strike at any time you went out of bounds or did something you know, inappropriate. And I have to believe that Jesus laughed I have to believe that. Now, I don't have a Bible verse for you, okay? There, it, there's nothing in the Bible or in the scriptures or in the eyewitness accounts where it says, you know, that Jesus told jokes or that he's like, you know, one day a rabbi and a priest walk into a bar. Like, there's nothing, I can't point to that. But <laughs> the scriptures tell us Jesus is fully human and that he experienced the emotions that we experience and humans laugh. Now, on top of that, you have to imagine Jesus traveled with 12 men, his 12 disciples, and oftentimes as they're traveling, they're camping outdoors, okay? So, like, connect the dots here. 13 dudes camping. You're telling me there were no pull-my-finger moments around the campfire? Come on. Had to be. Had to be. And you're like, oh, Jesus wouldn't do that. He probably would have just said, like, thou makest me laugh, Peter. I delight in thy jesting. Come on, Jesus was human. He laughed, he had fun. And if Jesus never laughed and had fun, then that's a pretty warped view of God. And for, for some of you, that's either the God you're running to or the God you're running from. And I gotta tell you, as a parent, when kids are growing up, their first idea, their first notion of what God might be like is whatever they see in you. You are a reflection, the earliest reflection in the life of your kids of what God might be like. So do they view him as angry? Or do they know that he delights in them, that he takes pleasure in them, that he receives joy in watching them experience joy? And don't you love it as a parent when you see your kids laughing and experiencing fun together? Is there anything better than when your kids are laughing, when they're enjoying themselves? You take pleasure in that. And God does the same thing with us. When was the last time that someone shot milk out of their nose? at your dinner table because everyone was laughing so hard? When was the last time that uh, everyone was laughing at you and you joined in because you realized you deserved being laughed at and everyone was just laughing because of something stupid that you did or something stupid that you said? When was the last time that it was just a, 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 uh, a moment where you're like, oh my gosh, I haven't laughed that hard in so long? We need those moments. We need those moments together. Kids need serious fun because those are moments that connect us and bond us together. And if you can't remember the last time you did that, maybe it's time to lighten up and have a little fun together as a family. So kids need these things. Here's the fourth thing that kids need. Consistent presence. Consistent presence. It's hard to hear that because we already feel overwhelmed. When we look at our schedule, we recognize all the things that we need to do and what little time there is to do it. And yet, have you ever stopped to consider exactly how much time you give your kids on any given week? Uh, there's a letter uh, that James, the brother of Jesus, wrote. And in fact, in two weeks, we're going to start a whole new series uh, going through the book of James. We're going to do that together. But uh, in one of these verses, James writes this, your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. Isn't that encouraging? Doesn't that make you feel good? <laughs> Like, in, in, the, in the whole arc of human history, your life's pretty short. And when you consider all of eternity, your life is like a morning fog. So the, however many years you have on this planet is like the fog that comes in the morning and it's like gone an hour later. That's like your life. And he's like, that's kind of a wake-up call. Every day we're given 86,400 seconds. And the question that we have to constantly confront ourselves with is, what am I doing to manage those seconds? What am I giving those seconds to? And here's the wake-up call for all of us. If you spend 10 minutes a day with your kid, that is 600 seconds, which equals less than 1% of your day. 
If you spend 30 minutes a day with your kids, that's uh, basically 1,800 seconds or less than 3% of your overall seconds. Think about that. Now, you're free to disagree with this, but I'm telling you from experience. As a, I was a youth pastor for 10 years. I worked with thousands of teenagers. If you don't give them your consistent presence, if you don't give them presence, uh, your, your presence, if you don't spend time with them, you are going to end up being a manager at a free bed and breakfast. That's what's going to happen. They will live there, they will sleep there and eat there, but you won't have the relationship that you want to have with them. And if you want to have influence in your child's life, you've got to spend time with them. Time is the currency of love. Do you want your kids to know that you love them? Then you've got to give them your time and attention. Make it obvious to them that they are not an inconvenience. Make it obvious to them they are not a burden. And one of the main contributing factors of healthy kids is having parents and other adults in their life who are present. Kids need that. And you may subscribe to this idea that, uh, well, you know, quality time over quantity time. And I can just tell you, you have, you have the right to believe that and you have the right to be wrong. Because here's what I can tell you, kids do not differentiate between quality time and quantity time. My eight-year-old is never going to be like, Dad, I know you only had 10 minutes to spend with me, but man, the quality of that time just filled my little tank. I mean, I, like, go. I don't even want you here anymore. I'm so full. I'm, I'm just loved. I just, I love it. They don't differentiate between quality time and quantity time. They need quantity of time. The idea of presence, you know why this is so difficult for us as parents? Because it's a challenge to our selfishness. And here's why. Let's be honest. There are seasons of our kids' life where they're not the most fun to hang out with. Like, who loves 100 rounds of Candyland back to back to back to back to back? Anybody? I can remember as a parent, like, you know, hate to admit this, but there was times where I snuck the ice cream card to the top of the deck. Like, oh man, oh, game over. All right, time for bed, guys. Because let's be honest, it, it isn't always that there isn't enough time. The fact is, during many seasons of their childhood, I'm not interested in the things that they're interested in. And the reality is, even as they get older, there's some things that my kids are interested in that I'm not really that interested in. My eight-year-old loves Minecraft. I'm not super interested in Minecraft, but I play a lot of Minecraft because I'm super interested in my eight-year-old. I want to get into his world. My 14-year-old is interested in things that I'm not interested in, but I'm interested in those things because I'm interested in him. My 16-year-old, my 19-year-old, they have different interests than even things that interest me, but I'm interested in those things because I'm interested in them. I want to be in their world. That communicates presence. And here's the reality. My kids will never remember how many people were in church today, how many groups we had this season, but they are going to remember if I was there for them to tuck them in at night, if we played games together, if, if we spent time together. One of my uh, friends and coaches is a guy named Larry Osborne, pastors of church in California. And he said this several years ago to me. It just stuck with me. It just made such an impact. He said, you've got nothing to prove and nobody to impress. You've got nothing to prove and nobody to impress. And this is the illustration he gave, and I, I love this. He said, there were so many times as a pastor where I'd go into the weekend getting ready to speak, and I knew that the talk that I was going to give was a C plus at best. And I knew if I went in on Saturday, I could tweak it, and I could work at it, and I could make it a little better, and I could bring it up to a B minus, maybe even an A. But to do that, I'd have to miss my son's basketball game. And I just wasn't willing to miss my son's basketball game to impress a bunch of people that my job wasn't to impress them. It wasn't to, I got nothing to prove, I got nobody to impress, but my son will remember if I was at his game or not. And now Larry is three grown kids who love the church, love their parents, love Jesus. And you know what it is? It's because he wasn't willing to sacrifice what was most important to try to impress other people. He recognized presence matters. Presence matters. If you're a single parent, I want you to know you're my hero. I don't know how you do it. You're figuring it out, but I know that God's going to bless your hard work and the effort that you're putting into these years. I truly believe that. Your kids are going to look back and appreciate it so much. But what kids won't appreciate is those of us who are working hard, not just to survive, but to thrive. Working hard to drive nicer cars and live in bigger houses and stroke our own egos. And, and then we blame our kids that we have to work so hard for their habits and lifestyle. And I, just, I can tell you, your kids would rather have your time than your money. I promise you. And here's where this comes from. This idea of presence is a really big deal in the scriptures because it's really the message of Jesus. In fact, God's presence is what brought everything into existence. 
And then God's presence shows up in human form in Jesus. And so when John is writing his account, his eyewitness account of Jesus coming into our world, this is the language that he chooses to use. In fact, here's what he says. So the word became human and made its home among us. So what does that mean? The word is a reference to Jesus pulled from the creation narrative where God says, let there be light and there was light. So God speaks this word and then it happens. But John tells us that actually happens through Jesus, that in the beginning was this word and that the word was with God and the word was God, that it's Jesus. And so God speaks and then Jesus acts. And here's what John tells us, that word takes on human form and actually dwells among us because God was not content to shout it from the heavens. He wanted to show it to us. He wanted to be with us. It wasn't enough for him to say, I love you. He wanted to be with us. His presence mattered. And then you go even beyond that. Here's what uh, the Apostle Paul writes to a group of people in the city of Ephesus. He says this, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. And then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. So now Jesus goes, look, I'm here with you in human form. I'm skin and bone and flesh and blood. But man, it's not even enough for me to be with you. I want to be in you. I'm going I'm to let my Holy Spirit dwell in you so that you have my presence with you every single moment of every single day. The Spirit of God is at home in your heart, in your life. And because of that, you can tap into the, the strength to be present in the lives of people that are in your life. So let me give you a couple practical ways to do that. Here's, here's how you spell presence. T-I-M-E. Time. You spell presence T-I-M-E. So here's a couple of practical ways. Face them. Eye contact is such a big deal. I can't tell you how many times when my kids were younger, I regret that I was physically present and mentally absent. I, I can remember my son one day just grabbing my cheeks and going, Dad! I was like, oh. It was like he was telling me a story and, you know, I was physically present and mentally absent. And then I was like, oh, hey. He like woke me up. But eye contact communicates something. Uh, another one, ask follow-up questions. Engage in conversation. That's your job, not theirs. I know your teenagers want to give you one-word responses, so you got to dig it out of them. Great time to do that is in the car. Guess what? They're trapped. <laughs> you can ask as many questions as you want to. Or uh, how about this? Ditch the cell phone, computer, until the kids are in bed. If you have younger kids, uh, finish the call before you walk in. I adopted this early on because I recognized there were times where I'd be on a call and I'd walk in and when my kids were younger, they're like, Dad! And then I'm like, shh, no, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. And I'm communicating to my kids, in this moment, there's something more important than you. And I didn't want to communicate that. So even if I had to park a block away, finish the call before I pulled in, I would do that. I would finish the call before I walked into the house because I wanted them to know that when I show up, I'm not just physically present, I'm mentally present. I'm emotionally available. And then say yes to all the dad, do you want to, mom, do you want to questions? Dad, do you want, yes. Dad, do you want to play Minecraft? Yes. Dad, do you want to play Candyland? Yes. A hundred times in a row? Yes. <laughs> See, your kids need you to be interested in their world, even, even if they give you the impression they, they, they don't want it. They do. It's essential for their development, for presence to happen. Man, they may, <laughs> what is it that you may need to sacrifice? because it confronts our own selfishness and our own preferences. One of the commonalities of amazing kids is that their parents are present. They show up, and your very presence is a sign of caring and connectedness in the life of your kids. And can I be honest with you? That's why kids love grandparents. Grandparents come and they hang out with kids, and they, they're mentally present, right? Grandparents have the ability to be, be present. They read the entire book. You know what I'm talking about. That's a little parenting pro tip. You skip pages. Oh, it's a fast book. Night, night. <laughs> We've all done that. Okay? It's not just me. I know. That's all right. Grandparents read every page, right? Grandparents are present, and they, they, they lay on the floor, and they cuddle. And what kid doesn't love to hear about different medicines and chronic health issues, you know? <laughs> but you get the point. Kids would rather be riding in a 1993 Ford Taurus and spending time with you than having a brand new Mercedes parked in the driveway and you're never around. 
They want your presence, and that never goes away. And here's the deal. If we will give them our presence now, they will give us their presence when they get older. And here's the reality. Your kids get older, and you want to hang out with them. And then they're like, eh. But the way that you make that happen is you give them your presence when they're younger. And the, if you reject their presence, they don't experience your presence in their life as they grow up, there's going to come a time in your life where you're craving their presence in your life and they're going to be too busy for you. And I don't say that to make anybody feel bad or guilty because I genuinely believe that even if that's where you find yourself, that God can redeem that, that God can bring health and wholeness and healing. I would not do what I do if I didn't believe that. But it may require you to say, you know what? We didn't get here overnight. It's not going to fix it overnight. But I'm going to start to work towards a better relationship with my kids. And for those of you that have younger children, man, take this opportunity now. Presence matters. And it is what God did for us. He sent Jesus into this world. It wasn't enough for him to say, I love you from the heavens. He wanted to show us in flesh and blood. And so Jesus came into our world. And, and Jesus said, I love you. And then in the most incredible demonstration of love, he allowed himself to be put to death. His body was laid in a tomb. And according to multiple eyewitness accounts, he rose from the dead. And here's what that means. This is a God who creates a universe through the spoken word. He has the power to overcome death. And that means he has the power to overcome death in you and me, which means our physical body will die, but we can live forever. That there's more to this life than this life. And you and I have been invited to be a part of God's family because when God sees you, you're like, yeah, but I'm not a church person. I'm not a God person. I'm not a, I'm not a Jesus person. I'm not a faith person. God created you and he loves you. And when he sees you, he sees his son and he sees his daughter. Even if you don't see yourself that way yet. And you've been invited. So this isn't about you earning your way to something, church attending your way to something, Bible knowledging your way to something. This is just something you need to know. The God of the universe, he created you and he loves you. And when he sees you, he sees a son and a daughter. And he's inviting you to be a part of his family, to trust him in his way of living. And if you've never said yes to that invitation, I want to invite you to say yes. Whether you're watching online here in the room, you can say yes by just agreeing with this prayer as we close. God, please forgive my sins. Forgive me for those times where I know I've walked away from you. I thank you that you've never walked away from me. And I pray, make me your son, make me your daughter, and then help me to trust you and your way of living as best as I know how from this moment on. And God, for every one of us who are parents and grandparents and step-parents and coaches and teachers and aunts and uncles, God, we have influence in the lives of kids. I just pray as we reflect on these things, as we look at serious fun and uh, consistent presence and ongoing affection and uh, unconditional acceptance, these big pillars in the lives of kids, give us the wisdom to know where to apply these things and then give us the courage to do it. We pray this in your name. Amen.